So it is 10 a.m. on the West Coast of the U.S. and 1 p.m. on the East Coast and 7 a.m. in Hawaii, as we just found out. <laughs> um, my name is, welcome Lisa as well. Um, my name is Rick Wayman. I'm CEO of the Foundation for Climate Restoration. Really excited to be here with you on this Saturday. Uh, so welcome to our Foundation for Climate Restoration monthly conference call for May 2022. The purpose of this call is to inspire you and forward our collective work to create the political will to restore the climate. So in a moment, I will introduce our guest speaker, Peter Fikowski, who many of you know, uh, he's a founder of the Foundation for Climate Restoration and author of the new book, Climate Restoration, the only future that will sustain humanity. Peter will speak for about 10 minutes and we'll have 15 minutes or so for Q&A. So please be thinking of questions you'd like to ask. Uh, we'll also today hear a grassroots victory from Philip Pascal. And after that, our training section will focus on writing letters to the editor that reference Peter's new book. Hey. We're also urging all chapters to connect with your chapter after every monthly conference call to write letters and plan other actions. Um, in order for us to more easily identify you for those post-call chapter meetings, uh, yeah. if change, change your how many steps you take this process to the no. Okay. Um, actually, yeah, if, if everyone wouldn't mind muting themselves, uh, that would be great. Thanks. And then you can just unmute uh, during Q&A if you have a question. Um, so, uh, sorry, back to where we were. If you would uh, change your screen name uh, to uh, your name and your chapter, uh, just a real quick tutorial on how to do that. Um, select participants in the bottom toolbar, click or tap on participants, uh, hover over your name and select more if you're on a desktop or tap your name if you're on a mobile, click or tap rename and um, enter, enter your name. So I'm actually doing this right now as we speak as well. So I just renamed myself Rick Wayman Santa Barbara, which is where I'm located. Uh, so as of right now, the chapters that have requested a post-call breakout room are Pacific Northwest and North Bay. If your chapter did not request a breakout room to use after the call and you'd like one, just write breakout in the chat along with the name of your chapter, and Terry and I will be sure to get that set up. So I wanted to remind you all, if you know of anyone who's looking for a way to make a difference, urge them to attend our intro call, which happens on the second Tuesday of every month. So this month, that intro call will be this coming Tuesday, May 10th at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. And Terry has put that link in the chat. So please save that link, talk with your friends about our work and share the link with friends who wanna make a difference on the climate. Now, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Peter Fikowski, founder of the Foundation for Climate Restoration and author of the new book, Restoration, The Only Future That Will Sustain the Human Race. Peter is the visionary behind our organization's primary goal of reaching a future where the climate is restored and we've reached under 300 parts per million of CO2 by 2050. So you can all tell your grandchildren you were on a call that happened just after the launch of Peter's new book. Again, that title, Climate Restoration, The Only Future That Will Sustain the Human Race. I wanted to share a, a snippet of an interview, or sorry, of a review in Publishers Weekly Book Life about this new book. Quote, Fikowski simplifies the science for easy comprehension and makes the case with such hopeful vigor that the book becomes something rare, a dead serious, no illusions look at climate change that doesn't stir despair. Uh, Fantastic review, and uh, it, it goes on from there. So um, 
Really excited to, again, have Peter here. Also very excited to announce that Peter is going to do a full one hour Q&A with us on Wednesday, May 11th at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. And the link for that Wednesday Q&A with Peter is in the chat. So Peter, I know that you're familiar with a lot of people on this call, but let me just, before I, introduce, or before I turn it over to you, let me give you just an, an idea of who you're talking with here. So as you know, many of our volunteers have already been deeply engaged with your new book. Uh, in fact, uh, just before, I think just before you got on, uh, Diane told me that uh, she has a stack of 10 that she's distributing to friends and family. Um, she's not the only one. On our weekly calls, Terry and I are seeing people's excitement when they hold up a stack of your new book. And, um, and they're, they're not just reading it themselves, they're spreading the word, they're getting it out. Terry has a stack right there. Uh, they're getting it out there, and, and that's really exciting um, and, and really speaks to the, to the great work that you do and the fantastic team that, that we have uh, that, that is out there doing the work to restore the climate. So again, everyone, please remember uh, to think of questions to ask after Peter's remarks. And Peter, over to you. Really honored to have you with us today. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you. It's great to be on. Um, I think this is my first <clears throat> weekly call that I've been on. And uh, I see Sam Daly Harris here. And uh, for decades and decades, Diane Warren and I were on the month, the week, the month, monthly calls from with results. So uh, everyone, thank you for being here. And so uh, let me display this. And I, <clears throat> so the uh, climate restoration is very exciting. I like to describe it as the good news. And it's very seldom that we learn, that we hear good news about the climate. And the good news is that simply we have everything we need to restore the climate by 2050. We have the, the technology, we have the economics and, um, the, the cost is going to be about $2 billion per year of commercial investment, which is about uh, a fraction of a percent of what we're smartly investing in the energy transition now. So the money is easily available. And the bad news, <clears throat> and the reason that we're here, is that the public goals are insufficient to restore the climate. And um, the the... Being a physicist, I like to describe the science of these things. This is uh, CO2 levels over the last 10,000 years. And the, on the left, you can see the warming uh, at the end of the last ice age. And, um, and you can see that CO2 stabilized around 270, 280 parts per million. And um, you know, it, you know, agriculture began around here. Much of our civilization began around here. And of course, the industrial revolution happened around here. And <clears throat> the, the, we call this period of development the, our safe harbor. That is, we don't know what's going to happen at today's levels. All of us are experiencing storms and wildfires. And we do know that there's a safe harbor. When you are in a ship <clears throat> and you have a stormy sea, you head to the nearest safe harbor that you've been to and that you know is safe. To put this in perspective, um, uh, this is uh, CO2 again, but this is over a million years rather than 10,000. So it's a hundred times a longer period of time. And you see ice ages. So. This last ice age, you can think of New York with a mile of ice on top of it. And then um, I described the agriculture develops. That's this little period in here. <laughs> um, the evolution of modern humans, uh, Homo sapiens, was about here, although some people say it was about here in this warm period. And the main point is that for 800,000 years, uh, humans have never lived on more than 300 parts per million. 
that, we, that we've just never had to. And of course, we don't know if we can. The, um, uh, the, the, you know, many of it, you have heard about the, uh, the 350 parts per million limit. And that's one that uh, Jim Hansen started talking about. And it, it's well accepted that ab above 350 parts per million, um, the survival of our species is in serious doubt. The ecosystems begin to collapse. And of course, we're seeing that with the collapse of the uh, permafrost, collapse of forests, the collapse of um, uh, uh, reefs. And um, we're right here. And um, the Paris goal is up here. And it's a little disconcerting, uh, I think for me and probably for most people to realize that the Paris goal net zero, uh, one and a half or two degrees warming is way up here where the highest level we've ever survived is here. And um, the, the, good, the thing you can see here is nature has done this many times. That is, we need to get from here back to here, back to the safe harbor. And that's the same thing nature did here 10 times in the last million years. And so we don't need to um, invent something new. It's very exciting. We, we can actually figure out what nature did and uh, do it faster. And um, nature, uh, and so you, you would ask, what does nature do? Nature has two solutions for getting CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, over very long periods, nature converts uh, carbon into, into limestone. And 99.9% .9 of the carbon on our planet is on the bottom of the ocean in the form of limestone, where uh, animals and plants <laughs> died from the, you know, the, their skeletons accumulated in, uh, as uh, calcium carbonate on the uh, seafloor. We can do the same thing. Um, the other thing that nature does over shorter periods of time, so here again, over 100,000 years, is uh, pho uh, photosynthesis in the ocean. Now, um, we, you know, I think everyone knows that the popular notion is to have a trillion trees because trees obviously synthesize uh, do photosynthesis and uh, pull carbon out of the air. It's well known that trees typically live for some number of decades and then die, and then they rot, and the CO2 goes back into the air. So it's a great short-term solution. In the ocean, um, if when, when I think of the ocean, I typically think of Hawaii and the blue ocean. And blue ocean is beautiful, but it's not green. Green is when you have photosynthesis. And so the question that nature had to solve is how do you turn a blue ocean green so that it's, uh, you're getting photosynthesis. And when it's green, the, the plants in the ocean with the algae, they, uh, they either sink or they get eaten by animals, which maybe get eaten by animals, which eventually sink. And in the deep ocean, there's not enough oxygen to rot. And so be, when the, uh, <clears throat> when the biocarbon, when the plants and dead plants and animals fall, they stay, they stay sequestered for tens and tens of thousands of years until at the end of the ice age, the currents change, there's oxygen available in the ocean and that CO2 rots essentially, and the CO2 comes out very rapidly. And so if someone tells you that it's rocks, well, rocks are a little bit of it. But it's and it's not CO2. It's not carbon that's fallen to the bottom of the ocean. It's it's what it's carbon that's suspended in the ocean, which is the trillion tons of CO2, the same CO2 that we need to get out. And so, uh, as, as I said, there are two pathways, and we know how to do them. Uh, the great thing about each of the pathways is that they have viable byproducts. So when uh, the company here in Silicon Valley that makes uh, synthetic limestone, and you're maybe wondering, what does that look like? Well, imagine an oyster. Um, I don't know when's the last time you had an oyster, maybe not too long. And you have this little animal and this beautiful shell. And the shell is carbon, uh, calcium carbonate, which is, which is limestone. 
And the point is, it's not difficult to create calcium carbonate. The chemistry is not very difficult. The process took some development. And it's, it's a very low energy process, right? The uh, uh, oysters and clams do not eat a lot of food, and yet they make these beautiful shells. And so the, uh, by, by using that chemistry to create limestone, um, it provides the rock that we need for our roads and our buildings. And uh, it's a trillion dollar business. So there's plenty of revenue to, uh, to switch over from quarried rock into synthetic limestone. The plant, the first plant opened up last fall and it's operating here in the Bay Area near the Carquinas Bridge in Pittsburgh. And um, the San Francisco airport has uh, bought up all of their production for the next two years. So it, it's in demand already. Um, and I think most of the people here are familiar with the fact that we're getting more and more rules last month uh, for the government to require use of the synthetic limestone. The other one, um, which is actually faster, the fish and seaweed using photosynthesis um, uh, it, it's interesting, the, the way it's implemented is using iron dust, the missing, uh, what, the missing nutrient in the ocean that allows the photosynthesis is, is iron. There's obviously lots of water and sun, and it turns out there's plenty of nitrogen in, mo in most of the ocean and phosphorus, but it's, it's iron. And the difficulty with iron is that it's not very soluble, so it doesn't stay in the ocean long. Life has figured out how to survive with unbelievably low amounts. It's about a millionth of a part per million, or maybe 10, 10 times that, but it's still, it took until just 30 years ago for science to be able to measure such very small quantities. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it worked. That is, we saw it earlier in the graph of the, uh, of the ice ages, um, I, I just was looking at it uh, last week, and this is the CO2 graph, it's called the Keeling Curve. Um, you, I'm, I imagine you've seen it. Um, and uh, th this is, it starts in 1957 when uh, Professor Keeling started it. This one uh, from the NOAA website it starts in 1980. You can see CO2 going up uh, steadily. It goes up and down every year. In the, you know, in the summer, you get uh, more photosynthesis. In the northern winter, you get less. So you get the variation. What's interesting is Mount Pinatubo, uh, some of us older people remember 1991, a huge volcano in the Philippines, and uh, pushed uh, millions of tons of rock dust into the ocean, which had a certain amount of iron. And if you look at the CO2, you can see that the CO2 level had been rising steadily. You know, it had been rising at a slower rate in the 70s and then a somewhat higher rate in the 80s. Um, it rose at the same rate in the late 90s and the 2000s, um, but there was a gap. And that gap is where the dust from the, um, from the Mont, Mont Pinatubo volcano increased the photosynthesis in the ocean. And that's a two and a half year uh, the, uh, uh, hiatus in the in the rise of CO two. Um, it's it, it's it, it's been discussed briefly in the literature, um, and I'm looking for a, a professor to help publish this in some way. But it's it's very clear that um, we can you know in our in our lifetime we've seen a, a two and a half year hiatus in the rise of CO two. And you might ask, why have we not heard about this before? And the answer is that the public, you know, that we've been told that the purpose, that the goal of climate is to reduce emissions. And of course, this has to do with levels and not emissions. So, um, and I'll wrap up there and really talk about what can we do. Um, we, need, we need leadership. So, uh, the Foundation for Climate Restoration um, is, is positioned to provide the leadership and government. Um, we're working with faith leaders, policymakers, um, to some degree scientists, to 
talk about that our goal is uh, to, to restore a climate that humans have survived and uh, can flourish in. So um, it says in conclusion, uh, we have everything we need and we just need the leadership to say, this is where we're gonna go. Uh, then we'll go there. Sort of like having a car and gas. First you need to say, oh, let's go to New York City. And then you go to New York City. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Peter. That was that was fantastic. Um, really, really appreciate uh, that that introduction. So let's see if you have a question for Peter. Um, please go to the bottom of your screen, click on the reactions button, and click on raise hand. And I'll call on you and ask you to unmute yourself, give your name and chapter, and ask your question. So let me just change my view here. Okay, fantastic. So we've got a couple hands up already. Uh, we'll start with Kathleen and then uh, go to Carol. So Kathleen, please introduce yourself and ask your question. Kathleen Cronin, uh, the Pacific Northwest team. Hi, Peter, nice to see you again. See you um, my question that came up was, where do we find the iron? Is Where are we gonna find the iron to put in the ocean? And is that a big deal at all? Thanks. Yeah, uh, it's not a big deal. The amount is, is um, oh, if you went to a steel mill, you would see a heap of iron, of iron dust, and that would be enough to do every the whole planet. Wow. Yes, yeah, so, so it's uh, not no, not a big deal. It's recycling. Yeah. Yeah, or re reusing or, or re reusing, repurposing what is what is essentially otherwise a waste product, right? Yes. Yeah. That's what we want. Thank yeah. you. And, and, and the cost is minuscule. The implementation 10 years ago, uh, where they, they uh, removed about uh, nine, 80 or 90 million tons of CO2, used 70 tons of iron sulfite, I think, or sulfate. Say those numbers again for me, please. Uh, One uh, million? Uh, the iron used was 70 tons and it removed about 80 million tons of CO2. Thank you. And, and the data got lost for political reasons. It got destroyed by the Canadian environmental uh, EPA. Uh, there were this weird political, a long political story involved. And so there aren't any scientific reports, but you can see it in the, in the CO2 levels, but, and you can really see it if you look at the historical uh, chlorophyll maps from NASA. I want to drill down on this because I live on Puget Sound where things like this can actually be done yes. next week. So my question is, uh, does it have to be done annually? Is it a one-time deal? What, what, how, how often would you have to apply iron dust to the ocean? Yeah. Okay, so uh, the details are to do it at scale. Uh, we, well, it, it's, it's normally done in an eddy because the, the circular eddy keeps it contained so the ecosystem adjusts. And, um, and also it feeds the fish because the main revenue is the fish. And so each eddy would be uh, fertilized probably every two years. So there's a fallow year and then a, a rich enriched year. And the idea is it could be done more, but the first thing to do is to imitate nature. And when there's a dust storm or a volcano, it's always intermittent. So the, the plan is do it intermittently. And it would just be, you just run a boat through, find the eddy, dump it and go bye-bye. Pretty much, pretty much. Okay. Uh, at the moment, you know, there are scientific studies being planned. They've not yet been funded. And that'll be one of the things that the foundation can work on is to encourage the government to fund these studies and to uh, encourage foundations to fund them. And I can, I'll, I can give information about the organization working on that. Thank you very much. Um, and then, um, then the commercial operations to do it, um, uh, you know, they need to do a certain amount of science to make maintain, you know, monitor the chemical levels in the ocean, may make sure that uh, everything's working well. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Great, Great questions, Kathleen. And before we go over to Carol, um, Peter, I just wanted to to kind of follow up slightly on that which is, can you just talk about the uh, fairly recent uh, National Academies study that came out uh, that, that was encouraging uh, 
further science. So kind of mainstreaming this, uh, this idea or this request for uh, further study on iron fertilization. Yeah, yeah. So, so it, it, the historical context is fascinating, and I'll I'll give it quickly. But um, in 1990, I, I mentioned they, the science, the first science on this got got done, and they called it the iron hypothesis. And John Martin said, "Give me half a tanker of iron, and I'll give you the next ice age." And people were alarmed because, again, they were under the illusion that, we, that climate was about emissions, not about CO2 level. And if we reduce CO2 level, that would that would give us license to keep emitting. And so a lot of the environmental community uh, did everything they could to stop it. The scientific community pursued it. Um, finally, in uh, 2012, the, the, the Alaska operation happened. Um, it looked like it did well. It produced huge harvest of fish. And um, part of the uh, environmental community said, no, this is unacceptable. The UN says we have to reduce emissions and this is a moral hazard. It, it makes it harder to reduce emissions. So don't, we can't allow that. And that's, uh, they uh, made a lot of accusations which scared off the whole scientific community. And that then takes us to the National Academies of Science study last December where they actually came back and the study was on uh, oceans carbon dioxide removal methods. And in it, they said for the first time in a long time, they said that this iron fertilization is a viable method. Now, as scientists, they recommended doing nothing but science for 10 years, um, uh, which it, I, I can, I, they, they couldn't say anything else. Because if they said we should do something, their fear, fear, of course, is that their reputations would be destroyed by the environmentalists who said, no, we told you don't reduce levels, reduce emissions. Um, fortunately, that, that tide has turned now. And so the National Academy Science report came out in December recommending more studies. And then um, the Schmidt Futures um, he, uh, Foundation here in the Bay Area uh, give, gave the initial funding to do that research. So it's just a, a hundred thousand dollar initial fund to for the scientists to meet. But of course, the intention is that for that to grow rapidly into a full fledged research. But the important thing for people to understand is we'll be doing both in, in parallel the research and the implementation because it's been done. Right. It's been done by Mount Tinatubo in 1991. It was done in Alaska in 2012. Um, but there was not, there was very little science done in 1991. And uh, the science that was done in 2012 was all lost due to political problems. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Carol, uh, over to you, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Carol. Hi, Peter. Um, I just joined the Rocky Mountain chapter. I'm based in Colorado. I'm very excited. I'm going to get your book tomorrow. Okay. Um, my question is a, a general question about the concept of climate restoration. As I understand it, we are saying today that if we bring CO2 levels in the atmosphere back to pre-industrial levels, we are going to restore the climate as we knew it. However, climate is much more than the even just the composition of the atmosphere. As we know, it's also a function of the state of environmental systems on Earth. And those have also changed tremendously since we started uh, emitting extra CO2. So my question is, do we have data that shows how the climate is going to actually go back to what we envision if we bring CO2 levels back down uh, or do we need to be doing modeling studies to understand this a little bit better? Because we've lost our polar ice caps, or, you know, our oceans have changed. Um, so is it, should we be also thinking about that? And, and what kind of climate do we think we're going to go back to uh, if we reduce CO2 levels? Wonderful question. Mm -hmm. So uh, the answer is yes and yes. Um, let me show you, we did a preliminary modeling uh, last year. Um, a colleague here, Shannon Fiume, um, took the, the, the MAGIX model, which is widely used in the last IPCC report, and um, 
she uh, we, she did a climate restoration model for the first time ever, and you can see the on the this is CO two levels. You can see it going up, peaking, and then from here she just assumed we would take out the sixty gigatons per year of CO two, and of course by design it gets to three hundred parts per million by twenty fifty because it was designed <laughs> to do that, and then um, CO two continued on down. The result is that we got to zero degrees warming by 2100. And of course, you know, the design of this phase was designed to get to deliver that point. The, um, what's great about looking at CO2 is A, it's easy to measure uh, you know, in Hawaii or anywhere. And the second is it's easy to control. That is, you, we know how to put CO2 into the air and we now know how to get CO2 out of the air. And then Carol, that leaves your questions like, well, when we're done, what do we end up with? And that, that's always a good question. And the second to the last chapter in my book addresses that. Um, for the most part, we expect things to get uh, pretty much back to normal. So um, uh, there are, you know, you, you've heard about major volcanoes over the last thousands of years. And there was the little ice age and all these things. So the ecosystems are quite resilient. And so most of our ecosystems will recover probably. Wow. And um, the Arctic ice, mm, it will, and no one has modeled how quickly. And one of the things that uh, I expect that the foundation will lobby for in Congress is funding to do that modeling. No one modeled it because no one asked the scientists, well, how do we restore the climate? They, the scientists were charged to say, tell us what happens if we screw up. We want to convince the policymakers to put money. And so tell us what happens if we screw up. They never asked, okay, tell us what success looks like. And that's the really the heroic job that the foundation has. Um, I think it'll be fun because people like good news. Yeah. The, the only bad news on the future climate is sea level rise. There's no evidence that that's <clears throat> going to be a pretty picture, even with um, with uh, getting CO2 back. We don't know how bad it will be or not bad, but uh, if you're on the coast, tell your great-grandchildren to sell your house. <laughs> yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much Peter. Peter. And a uh, great, great question, Carol. That went by really fast. Unfortunately, we have to move on uh, with the rest of our program, but Peter, thank you so much. Um, I wanna remind people, and John, uh, I did see your question in chat. We'll be sure to address that first in the hour long Q&A session that we have with Peter on Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, May 11th at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. So, uh, and, and uh, obviously a lot more time for additional questions as well. So Peter, I know you're really busy with your book talks and everything else that, that you've got your, uh, your hands in. Feel free to stay on for a little more of the call if you can. Uh, but on behalf of all of us, I, I'm just so grateful for your inspiring vision, for your partnership, your support, and uh, all of us extend our deepest gratitude to you. Thank you. Mm, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to Wednesday. And lots of good questions. And really, thank you for the great questions. That it's always the highlight of my day getting these questions. Excellent. Good. To, good to know. Okay, and I'll, I'll listen on for a few minutes. Great. I, thank you, Peter. I, I, I'm working on on uh, our methane experiments here, so I'm going to go back to my lab in <laughs> in about 20 minutes. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so just a couple of announcements. Uh, since our chapters were started in the new offering in October, we've had 11 letters to the editor published and 17 meetings with elected officials. Uh, I wanna remind you all to please report your meetings with elected officials, your published media, and your outreach events to Terry, and by going to the website reporting portal, uh, which I believe Terry just put in the chat. So please use that, it's really help for, helpful for us to keep track of all the wonderful accomplishments that, that you all are making happen. Speaking of which, uh, I want to turn it over to uh, a grassroots victory. So each month we have a chapter member share a grassroots victory 
This month, I'm delighted to ask Philip Pascal from the North Bay chapter to share his experience. Uh, Philip, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Hey, thanks, Rick. Well, my experiences in advocacy began over a year ago after I took on being the chair of the North Bay chapter of Friends of Climate Restoration. Uh, I had never met with an elected official, written a personal letter to an elected official, or called an elected official's office before that. Uh, so this was new ground and unfamiliar territory for me. My first meeting was with Teresa Barrett, the mayor of Petaluma, where I live. It happened about 13 months ago when me and a couple other chapter members met with her to request that she declare Petaluma a climate restoration city and also create a procurement policy for low embodied carbon concrete, known as LECC. Well, it didn't feel, I didn't feel nervous as I wasn't alone and had studied. So I knew what I was talking about. At that time, Blue Planet, which Peter mentioned earlier, was not up and working yet. So the mayor didn't see how she could create a procurement policy when it wasn't available to get low embodied carbon concrete. I felt like it was just too soon to make the request. If, however, I did feel like there was an opening to come back again sometime in the future and make the request again. The mayor was very receptive to what was being presented and even mentioned similar work being done in Marin, California that she was aware of. Well, as I learned more and found out more and discovered Carbon Cure, a company that's being able and available to retrofit a concrete plant so that they could produce the low embodied carbon concrete, I continued reaching out with my chapter members and we had a meeting with the policy expert for Senator Mike McGuire, then the senior staff person for Assemblyman Mark Levine, and then again with Teresa Barrett, the mayor of Petaluma, and three other members of the Climate Action Commission. Well, this went better than the first time since there was a way for companies to obtain low embodied carbon concrete, making a procurement policy possible. The mayor said she would check with a supervisor she knew in Marin to see what she knew on the subject of low embodied carbon concrete. Also the chair of the Climate Action Commission, Ann Edminster, knew much on the subject and said what we were requesting, quote, could be done. Anyway, anyone could do the same as I did along with my chapter members. Plus Terry Pugh joined in on some of the calls making me feel like we had an expert to present what we were requesting. Terry was wonderful. The training we received from Terry and Sam in writing letters to the editor, as well as emailing our representatives, requesting a meeting with them made the process very easy and doable. And my main takeaway is how simple it is to request a meeting with any official. Plus Zoom makes it very easy as well. That's great. Thank you so much, Philip. Uh, that's really exciting to hear about. I'm grateful to you for your leadership and your persistence in meeting with and influencing elected officials. Uh, you and the, all the members of, of the North Bay chapter are, are really just doing a, a really impressive and outstanding job. Thank you. So each month we also will have a brief training or teach a new laser talk or role play a call to an elected official or another community leader. Uh, I'm delighted now to turn it over to Terry Pugh, our Director of Civic Engagement, to lead this training session. Uh, Terry, thank you so much, as always, for your amazing support of the chapters. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Rick. Um, the May action sheet is in the chat. I'm going to briefly read items one through three in the take action section at the bottom of the May action sheet and then focus on writing the letter itself, items four and five. These letters are going to be um, helping us to highlight Peter's book. Number one, find the local newspaper you will write to. To learn what is required for the letter to the editors, excuse me, letters to the editor, Google the following, name of the paper, letters to the editor guidelines. Note the number of words allowed and how a letter is submitted. Do you submit on the newspaper's website or do they provide an email address to use? Number two, Think about the placement, a larger daily newspaper or smaller weekly paper. If you're writing a letter to a larger daily paper, 
um, <clears throat> or um, if you write a letter to a larger daily paper, find an article or editorial that provides a good angle or hook to come in from for discussing climate restoration. If you're writing a smaller weekly paper, you don't have to reference an article. Just write in a way that makes it clear why the local readers would care about this issue. Read a few letters to the editor in the newspaper that you are writing to in order to make sure that you're going to follow that format or see how they started and the general tone that they're using. We've gone over that in previous calls, but um, I want to focus our time today on writing the actual letters, starting with numbers four and five in the take action sections. So write your letter, use the guidelines the newspaper has provided, and A, share any feelings of despair you've had about climate change, B, how learning about and taking action on climate restoration has given you hope and see how that message is laid out clearly and persuasively in Peter's book, Climate Restoration, The Only Future That Will Sustain the Human Race. Number five, make sure to include the ask. Urge readers to read Climate Restoration, The Only Future That Will Sustain the Human Race and share its inspiring message with others. And B, join with us at the Foundation for Climate Restoration. Now, why don't you look for an article in today's paper that would be a good angle for a letter to the editor on climate restoration right now. Just go ahead and try and look up an article in your paper um, that's, that, that's talking about climate change. I'm going to take an article that appeared in the Seattle Times four days ago that you'll want to find, but obviously you'll be finding something from today's paper. The more recent, the better. It should be it's pretty easy at this point, actually, to find things about climate change. When I looked this morning, I found something in the Washington Post, the New York Times, and in the Seattle Times right next to me. So I know that this is pretty common fare right now in newspapers. And it's easy to find um, people discussing initial discouragement and despair about climate change. If you just, actually I did it this morning. If you just put in despair and climate change, many interesting articles pop up immediately. It was really rather tragic. But what I really like about Peter's book is this is about looking forward and actually focusing on solutions. So um, what you write in your letter to the editor could be a real lifeline to somebody who's feeling that kind of despair. Remember to urge your readers to read the book and join us at the Foundation for Climate Restoration. So does anybody have anything that they found that they'd like to uh, discuss with the group? I see Carl Dance has his hand up. Yeah, great uh, intro to the process, Terry, as always. Um, thank you for that. So uh, following your guidance, I went to the Mercury News, our local paper, which by the way is big circulation. They call themselves the newspaper of Silicon Valley. And uh, I would say that they are. Um, and just today, uh, one of our congressional representatives, Representative Ro Khanna, uh, has an opinion piece uh, called Loosening Big Oil's Grip on Our Wallets and the Planet. Um, I haven't even started reading this yet, but I know it's gonna offer plenty of opportunities as the hook, as you put it, that's a or the great angle, book. I forget the word you used. Yeah, yeah. no, that's, that's perfect. And that's, that's a great way to um, kind of highlight the whole situation. It's not just one or two people that are feeling um, despair. It's, it's huge chunks of the population. And we know that this is an issue that people are paying attention to, I think within the last year or two more than uh, had been previously. Well, thank you for that one. Does anybody else have, uh, oh, I see Melanie has her hand up. Go oh, ahead, Melanie. Uh, surprisingly, as you said, it's always easy to find something. And uh, so I just did a search on the Denver Post and this has to do with the end of campfires in Colorado. Mm. Um, Due to climate change and fires and our $37 billion outdoor recreation economy that we're worried about, uh, et cetera. So there's easily an angle in from there. Um, 
you know, they, it, it, uh, it goes through quite a bit. I haven't read it either, but I can see in here that it, it uh, definitely offers itself to that easily. That's great. That was see see how simple it might be for you to find something if you're if you're unnerved by the idea of finding something that's relevant. Almost everything is relevant at this point to climate change. At least that's been my experience. And almost everything that's related to climate change is also related to despair. So I find that Peter's message is very relevant to almost any paper that I pick up. We have a very small local paper where I'm living presently called Federal Way. And it's a weekly paper. And even with weekly papers, you have things like uh, banning bags. You can use that as a hook to get in there and talk about, uh, about doing actions. And um, everybody's trying their best to uh, respond with solutions. And here's a book that does it. So this will get printed most likely um, if we focus on our area and we point out that this is something that we ourselves might have felt great despair over. I know I have at points. And then describing looking forward and finding solutions. That's one of the main keys to Peter's book. And it's actually the main key to our organization <laughs> is finding solutions and helping to highlight them and make sure that uh, communities know about them, making sure that elected officials know about them, and also professionals uh, know about these solutions. So when we talked about, say, building materials and um, discussing how we can uh, sequester a lot of carbon inside concrete, these are things that can easily be brought up in that letter to the editor. I, for one, on my personal one, wrote about um, an article about the uh, glaciers melting in Washington state, which, as you guys would remember, we had our 100 degree days, which are uncommon in Washington state, that melted some, uh, some glaciers, which are year round ice formations on the Olympic Peninsula um, is what the focus was with the Seattle Times just the other day. So I wrote a piece, um, I have not heard from them. So, you know, these things happen, it might not be printed. But the point is I did send in my 200 words, which were required by my paper <laughs> to um, discuss how I went from seeing yet another article <laughs> discussing how terrible the situation is to reminding myself that I feel like solutions and being solution oriented has really helped me to move forward. And then I finished off my piece with um, discussing uh, the new book. And could I you could, read your, could you read your letter to the editor? Um, yes, I sure can. It was no surprise when I read this article describing the loss of year round ice in Washington state. Most of Western Washington had a front row seat as we watched in horror the melting of snow on Mount Rainier, intensely sped up by the heat wave last June. It was depressing and familiar, and I found it emotionally draining to have a weather, to, excuse me, to have to weather another round of arguments as the climate shifts before our eyes, endangering every shred of life on the planet. But my perspective has shifted as I reached solu researched solutions. While many are mired in discussions over whether climate change is real, a sector of our population has been developing natural and technological solutions. It is a positive perspective to focus on the root of all these changes and restore the climate itself. Removing the excess carbon dioxide, a central component, component of climate restoration is an exciting way forward. The idea of restoring the climate is powerfully laid out in the book, Climate Restoration, The Only Future That Will Sustain the Human Race by Peter Fiakowski. If you share my feelings, my earlier feelings of hopelessness, I urge you to read the book, share its message, and join us at the Foundation for Climate Restoration. So that's my version. <laughs> Thank you. Has anybody else, um, have any ideas of how they would start it or, oh, I see Melanie has her hand up. Yeah, I just have a question. So then did you sign it uh, 
Foundation for Climate Restoration. You just signed it as an individual. Yeah, I'm, I'm an individual living here. So I went with Terry Pugh, 3311, <laughs> my address, <laughs> my city, and um, my phone number. They'll ask for that because they want to be able to double check in some cases to prove that you are the person writing this and that you actually stand behind your opinion. They won't publish my address or my information. That's the nice part. Sure. They're just using it to you know, verify I'm a human and I live there. <laughs> and Melanie, just to, to take that a step further, some papers, when they contact you to make sure you're a real person, et cetera, they will ask if you have an affiliation mm. and sometimes they will choose to include that, you know, so it, it, they would print Melanie Trent, Rocky Mountain Chapter Foundation for Climate Restoration, or they might just say Melanie Trent and your city. So it, it's, it really depends on the, the individual publication. Thank you. And that's a great question. Um, were you done, Melanie? I don't mean to cut you off if you had any more you wanted to say. Oh, no, thank you. Okay, I see Jim Lerner has his hand up. Can you see this paper? Yes, the Sacramento Bee. Okay. Um, I looked in the paper at your suggestion, Terry, and I found only two articles that may be related to climate change, but I wanted to ask your opinion on them. One of them is a beer company that's Japanese owned and it's a local beer company. The other one is homelessness because that is an issue that is basically facing all of us. Do you have any suggestions on how we can do that? Over. That is a great question. Um, well, how, how, would, how would you guys think it would be good to start that off with perhaps some sentences. I mean, usually the paper wants you to go back and reference the article that you're talking about. So if he's talking about the homeless situation, you would start off saying perhaps your feelings about it. I mean, I was saddened to read about the homeless situation and the, that was discussed in article, blah, 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 date, blah, blah, blah. Um, I see Carl has his hand up. Go yeah, ahead. just Jim, great question. And my first reaction is pick which of those two most resonates with you. Like mm -hmm. if you're a big beer fan, which I am, <laughs> I, I, I could think off the top of my head, you know, probably the whole first paragraph, uh, you know, homelessness, if that's what, you know, tugged at your heartstrings when you read that article, go with that. So that's my thought is like, which one would resonate the most with you personally so that you can include you know kind of your angle on it and your personal story in the beginning of the letter okay thank you that's a good idea um i tell you what I'll, I'll react to both of them and then i'll send them to everybody that wants to read them we'll see what, what we'll get feedback and we'll see what works and what doesn't Over. yes make sure i'm included in that thanks jim i'll do bye bye great question and great answer carl of course Cynthia, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, well, I was just looking in my little Marin County Independent Journal, and there's a thing here where um, some millionaire donated $1.1 billion to Stanford for the devoted to the study of climate change and it and its solutions. So I think that will be a good one to, um, and my other question was going to be, so when I signed my name, wouldn't it be better if I did say Foundation for Climate Restoration? I just want to get the the, sure. the the sound of this around anybody and everybody. That makes total sense to me. Do you have any comments on that, Sam or Rick? Well, Sorry, I would just yes. say, yeah, go ahead, Sam. It's fine to m mention that you're a member or you're the leader of the local chapter. I think that's all fine. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, so there, there's actually a, a, a pretty important question that just popped up in the chat. And I was wondering, Terry or Sam, if, if you could address that. Uh, I, um, okay, so sh Sam, if you had a chance to read, I didn't mean to cut. Yeah, it's true. I'll address it just for a second. Um, if you'll notice in Terry's letter, the first paragraph was about the article and the um, 
uh, concern in melting ice uh, in Washington state. In a sense, the second paragraph was about uh, her earlier feelings of despair around climate change, but her research on what can be do done about it and some issues around climate restoration. It was only that when she got to the third, third, the last third of the letter that she then referenced um, Peter's book. So it's not a letter that's all about Peter's book. It's about the article, her despair, and now her hopefulness and research. And in the final section, it references a book that, that lines that out. We'll see, but it's clearly not. If you look at the one, two, three, four, especially four and five in the action sheet, um, it's not wholly and mostly about a book. Hopefully that's useful. That's very useful. Thank you. Thank you. Good question, too. Thank you for asking. I see we have Evan. Would you like to go? Uh, yes, I was adding a comment to, to Jim Lerner about the homelessness topic. He could talk about uh, sequestering carbon by, by building homes. Mm -hmm. Great point. And um, Yes, I think uh, as an example in California, we have um, SB 1297, which is about sequestering carbon in the built environment, which is uh, for that particular situation, um, cement. So that's that's a really relevant point. Thank you. What's the bill again? Um, California's SB yes. 1297. Okay, thank you. I think it's called uh, carbon storage in the built environment but something comparable to that, at least. Great question. Thank you. Um, Sally, would you like to go? Uh, yes, and um, I'm, I'm not responding exactly to your question, but I am accentuating what Carl said about look for what moves you mm -hmm. in an article or look for articles that move you and draw you. Mm -hmm. um, I did write one letter and what drew me was my being appalled that my town didn't have a buy-in for no more gas pumps mm -hmm. in our county. And I got charged up about that and was like, Mother Teresa, hey, why don't you <laughs> have gas pumps? And then in the process of writing the letter, I got that I needed to be uh, honey and not vinegar to really try to make a difference. Now, my letter wasn't published. I changed it. I felt really good about it. And I haven't been inspired to write another one yet. <laughs> but thank you. That's I can try. That's excellent. Thank you so much. I see that we're at one minute too. I'd like to turn the call back to Rick. Great. Thanks, Terry. And Sally, let me just note the key word in what you said at the end there is yet. I know you will be inspired. <laughs> uh, you're a great letter writer. Uh, so thank you, Terry. I'm so moved by everyone on this call and your stand for a restored climate. Uh, it, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today and for all the work that you do throughout the weeks to uh, advance this work. Um, I, I want to just uh, put a couple reminders out there. Uh, first, please again invite friends who are looking for a way to make a difference to the intro call on Tuesday, May 10th at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific to learn more and see how they can get involved. Terry just put that link in the chat. Uh, also, Peter Fikowski will be back with us to do a one hour Q&A on Wednesday, May 11th, this coming Wednesday, again at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, Terry will put, there it is, there's that link. And then finally, for those who have, for those chapters that have requested it, which again is North Bay, Pacific Northwest and Rocky Mountain, we'll put you in your breakout rooms in a moment so please stay on if you heard your chapter. 
Uh, now, just before we close, I want to just ask everyone to unmute and, and say goodbye. And again, stay on. If you're in a breakout room, you'll go there automatically in a minute. All right. Thanks, everyone. Great to Great see job, you. And, uh, see you yeah. Great Thank meeting. you, everyone. Oh, thanks, Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.